Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Your old commercials, we thought they were so cute, especially when they used chimpanzees to mimic our telephone habits. And, and did you notice the guy that used to say, can you hear me now? He's now doing a commercial for a different telephone company now. But I wonder, I, I wonder if God ever feels like saying that to you and me. I, I wonder if God ever feels like saying, Fred, can you hear me now? John, in, in writing his letter, never uses the words, can you hear me now? But he repeats something so often in, a, in this letter. It's as if he doesn't think the people really heard what God was saying to them. And, and by repeating it as often as he did, it's almost as if he's saying to them, can you hear me now? It, it was in a Michigan newspaper some time ago. The story was so incredible, I cut it out and I filed it away. Over 20 years ago, Susie Shanice was 53 years old, a teacher at Brown Elementary School in St. Joseph, Michigan. In November of that year, she became ill. She went to the doctors. They discovered that Sally had a brain aneurysm in her right frontal lobe. The surgery was her only option, they said. The, the doctors explained all the risks involved and all the dangers that would be associated with such a risky surgery. But, but surgery was really her only option, and so it was performed, but it left her absolutely paralyzed, and she no longer had the ability to speak, no longer had the ability to communicate. Because her husband had to continue to work to support the family and provide the health insurance, Sally went to live in the Lakeland Continuing Care Center, but every day, every day, Frank, her husband, would come over and spend time with his wife. For 20 years, he had been going to the Lakeland Community Care Center, spending time with his wife, talking to her, never getting a response back, telling her about what was going on in their life, and never once did he get any response back. But all of that changed on August 23rd that year. He walked into a room that morning, just like he had been doing for the last 20 years, and said what he had been saying for the last 20 years. Hi, honey, how are you? But that morning, he was absolutely jolted for the first time in two decades, he heard Sally's voice when she said, okay. Well, as you can imagine, he was taken back. But he composed himself enough to ask her a few questions. And, and she remembered that their next wedding anniversary would be their 53rd anniversary. And she remembered that her name was Sally. And she remembered that his name was Frank. And as I read that story, I, I tried to just imagine what must have been the emotions that, that surged through his mind and body as he heard his wife say his name for the first time in over 20 years. I, I wonder what, what he must have felt when he heard Sally call him Frank once again. Uh, obviously, this was a man who deeply loved his wife. This is a man who understands what commitment is and what it means to keep your marriage vows. I think lesser men may have sought a divorce or at least would have tried to justify not going and seeing her every day for 20 years, especially when she couldn't communicate. And, and he really didn't know if anything he was saying was even getting through to her. What Think about it. What must it have been like to hear her voice again, to, to hear her respond to the very same question he had been asking for 20 years and getting no response. And especially what would it have felt like when she heard him, when he heard her whisper his name, Frank. I can't even imagine what that must have been like for him. It's greater than my imagination. And then I began to wonder, what must it be like for God when we finally respond to his voice? So often he has spoken to us you know he has he's wooed us and challenged us and often we have been the one who have been unresponsive often we've we've acted like oh we didn't hear him or we didn't know if it was God speaking or we didn't have the ability to respond what must it be like for God when we finally get it when sometimes after years it finally sinks in, and we start responding to him, and we start doing what he's told us to do. I'm absolutely convinced in that moment, when we finally get it, and, and, and we finally respond to the voice of God, we are the source of great, incredible, 
and unimaginable joy for God. Think about it. How you respond to God can be the source of great joy for Him. Have you ever thought about that? You can bring great joy to God. I, I don't know why I hadn't seen it before, but when Jesus is telling the parable about the one lost sheep being found and the lost coin being found, Jesus tells how there is great rejoicing in heaven when one sinner repents. And, and for some reason, I always thought that it was the angels rejoicing. Now, you may not have thought that because that's not what the scripture says. It, it doesn't say that the angels were rejoicing. In, in fact, listen to this verse. The woman who found the lost coin calls all of her friends and neighbors and says, this is Luke 15, 9. She says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. And then the scripture goes on and Jesus says, in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So who's doing the rejoicing there? Well, it's not the angels rejoicing in the presence of angels, just like in the parable. It's the one who found that which has been lost. It's God doing the rejoicing. It's God hooping it up. It's God getting excited and rejoicing and celebrating. You see, when we finally really hear God's voice and we finally respond and, and we finally get it after he's been telling us something sometimes for years, and we finally get it. It's God who rejoices. I think that's so cool to think about. John, in writing this letter, is hoping that these good people will finally get what God has been telling them for years. In fact, John keeps repeating it and repeating it all throughout this letter as if he was saying, can you hear God now? Can you hear what he's saying? Are you going to respond? Remember where we're at in this letter. We've been looking at John's first letter on Sundays, and we saw John telling these folks last week in the first half of chapter 3, don't dabble with the deadly. Don't dabble in sin. S send down some deep spiritual roots so that you can survive the storms when they come your way. John is very clear. He said in no uncertain terms, you cannot have a continuous, deliberate pattern of sin in your life and be a Christ follower. John says that's impossible. Now, from what John said in, in that first half of chapter 3, we saw we need, as Christ followers, we need to possess a sense of offense. We need to understand how offensive sin is to God. We need to understand that God does not simply wink his eye at sin and say, oh, well, humans will be human. We need to understand that when it comes to sin, God doesn't say, I wish you wouldn't, but if you just have to, I understand. We need to understand how offensive Sin is to God because it hurts, it destroys, it damages those that he loves so deeply. We need to understand how when the one who calls himself or herself a Christian, but then continues a pattern of deliberate, continuous sin, that the Hebrew preacher is right when he wrote, we are trampling the Son of God under our feet if we treat as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified us, and we have insulted the spirit of grace when we continue to sin. We need to possess a sense of offense when it comes to sin. But we also saw, John was saying, as Christ followers, we need to possess a sense of oughtness. Now, that's kind of an old-fashioned word, ought, but it's a really strong word. It means as Christians, we have a moral obligation, a duty to do that which God has told us to do. And what John is saying we ought to do, we are morally obligated to do, it is our duty to do this, is the very thing he kept repeating over and over again. And, and he isn't sure that these good folk have gotten it yet. So we want to look at that. I, I really think God was saying to them, do you hear me now? Let, let's start reading in verse 11 of chapter 3 of 1 John. This is the message you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Can you hear me now? Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers. If the world hates you, we know we pass from death to life because we've loved our brothers. Can you hear me now? Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. 
Can you hear me now? This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Can you hear me now? If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Can you hear me now? This, then, is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts did not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his command and do what pleases him. Can you hear me now? And this is the command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Can you hear me now? Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit that he gives us. Can you hear me now? And these aren't the only places in this letter that John keeps repeating how we must, how we ought, how we are morally obligated. It is our duty to love one another. Evidently, this is the thing these good Christian folk were struggling with. That they just weren't getting it yet. And so John is reminding them again and again with the expectation it was finally going to sink in that we ought, as Christians, we are morally obligated it is our duty to love one another. And remember, he's writing this to people who are in conflict with each other, who, who didn't believe the same way as each other, who, who some were, were living pretty immoral lifestyle. He was writing to this people who were very condescending, some of them, and were saying, hey, we're more spiritual than you, and we know more than you, so you better listen to us, you poor little stupid Christians. And as you can imagine, that made the other side hop and mad. Who, who, did, who, who did they think they were saying something like that to us or implying it? And it was to those very people that John, in living in that situation, that he's saying, as Christ followers, you are morally obligated. It is your duty to love one another. So what he says is directed at those who are in conflict with others. Let's make sure we don't avoid what he's saying. Let's make sure we don't say, oh, that's just for them. Uh, let's not act like he isn't speaking to us. Uh, let's realize, as you and I look at God's word, he's saying to each one of us, can you hear me now? Well, let's look first at the command. That's letter A in your notes, the command. We see it right there, verse 11. We all know it. We should love one another. It's based on what Jesus told the disciples who had been arguing with each other about who is the greatest and the best disciple this was right after he had washed their feet they'd eaten the passover meal together john had told them who was going to be the betrayer judas had taken off he had told how peter would deny him and then john the same john who who wrote this letter told how jesus looked those disciples right in the eye and said a new command i give you love one another as i have loved you so you must love one another by this all men will know you're my disciples if you love one another and the absolute first thing we need to understand about this command is that you and I are responsible to living this out. Now we're promised, God tells us, he will give us everything we need to be able to do this. But it's absolutely up to us and every individual, whether we're really going to put this into practice, what we know to be God's command for us. And, and this is one of those things. That if you've been around the church very long at all, you've heard this so often. You've become so used to it, maybe even become callous to it, that I really think we can choose not to follow the command or pick and choose who we're going to love and not even feel guilty about it and somehow think we're getting away with it. You understand, you and I cannot choose to not actively love someone, one person, and really be a follower of Jesus Christ. Just as John said earlier, you and I can't continue in a pattern of deliberate sin in our life and still be a Christian. Now he's saying, you, you can't hate somebody and still be a Christian. Verse 15, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. That's pretty clear cut, isn't it? So we are responsible for choosing whether we're going to follow this command or not. 
Second thing we need to understand about this command is that the results don't matter. You see, sometimes I think we get it in our mind, we'll love someone or we'll forgive someone or we'll reach out to that particular person with the idea that if we do what God wants, if we follow his command, then God has obligated himself to snap his almighty fingers and change that person. So that one who is continually doing us harm will change and stop hurting us. And the one who betrayed us will change and tell us how sorry they are. And the one who treated us like dirt and lied about us and stabbed us in the back and called us names, all of a sudden will become a nice person. And so because we're expecting those results, that's why we follow the command. And John is saying, you don't get it yet. You don't love that person because of what will result in them. You love that person because it's the right thing to do. It's what God has commanded of you and me. In fact, John pretty much tells us that even if you do everything right, if you love that person, if you forgive that person just the way Jesus would, chances are you're going to be hated even more so. Uh, so as he talked about Cain murdering his brother, simply because Cain knew his own actions were evil and Abel, his brother, his actions were righteous. And then John said to us in verse 13, do not be surprised, my brother, if the world hates you. You understand, if the world hates you, or make it more personal, if that one person still hates you, and they don't change, and they still do the hurtful, and they still do the hateful, that does not give you and me a reason or an excuse or justify us not following the command to love one another. The command is clear-cut. We are responsible in choosing to follow the command. And what will result, us following the command, is not the reason we follow the command. We follow the command because it's the right thing to do. Second thing we see from what John is saying is a clarification of what it means to really love one another. Thankfully, he's not talking about ooey-gooey feelings. He's not talking about us feeling warm fuzzies every time a person walks into the room. He's talking about our actions. Let it be in your note, the clarification. John gives two explanations and two examples of what it really means to love one another. Explanation number one, John says, it means to lay down your life. And he uses Jesus as an example. Verse 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. That's a pretty clear-cut explanation of what it means to really love one another. And, and we've all heard stories of those that have done that very thing. We've heard of the heroic acts of soldiers who have jumped on live grenades to save their, their fellow soldiers, and parents who died when they were protecting their children from intruders. We've, we've heard stories of, of firemen and other first responders that have gone into fires to save the lives of others only to lose their own life. And, and none of us will forget the heroic efforts of those firemen on 9-11. Do, do you remember hearing of, of Tedrick Castillo? I mean, school shootings have become way too common. And, and we've almost become callous to them when we hear about yet another one. And, and we almost forget about them the next day if it, if it isn't too close to home. But last May, j just weeks ago, at, at a school outside Denver, Two students opened fire in the school, and, and Kedrick, a student, ran, rather than running away, ran towards the shooters, making sure to try to stop them from what they were doing. And in the process, he was killed. He sacrificed his life to save the other students at his high school. Some of his friends said he loved robotics, he loved helping the elderly in his community. And yeah. oh, one of the witnesses said of Castillo, who was due to graduate from high school in three days, charged one of the shooters who killed him, giving all of us enough time to escape underneath our desk to get our safe and, and to run across the room to escape. And we hear stories like that. We hear stories about people like him, and we're moved. And we think, what great love, what courage, what sacrifice. And, and we kind of hope that if we were ever in a situation like that, we would be willing to do something so noble, so heroic, so loving. And yet, realistically, 
We don't face situations like that very often. I just turned 63, and I've never had the opportunity to, to give my life to save another person's life. We could live our whole life and never have the opportunity to give our, our life, to lay down our life for someone else. And even if we did face that situation, and we chose to do the noble and the loving, we could only do that one time. So we need to understand John meant something more than just laying down your life for someone else to show them that you love them. That brings us to the second explanation. To really love another might mean you have to be willing to lay down your life for someone else, but it definitely means we have to be willing to lay down our rights and our wants and our way and our desires and our aspirations. It really is talking not simply about a one-time event, lay down your life, but about a mindset and a lifestyle. Lay down yourself for the good of another. You see, John clarifies that in the very next verses when he says, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. He's talking about a mindset and a lifestyle. To really love another, we have to be willing to lay down our rights if it means it'll help our brother. We have to be willing to lay down our wants and our way and our desires and our aspiration if it means we can help someone who's in need. You see, John was saying, don't you get it yet? We can all talk about laying down our life for someone, but it's simply meaningless talk if we're not willing to go out of our way and sacrifice for the good of others. If we don't help that one who's in need, then all our talk about loving another it's just a crock. And remember, John was writing to some people in a church who weren't getting along. There were some heavy-duty conflicts. There were hurt feelings. There were some who were saying or implying, I'm better than you, I'm more spiritual than you, and others are saying, oh, no, you're not. And John was saying, why don't you start right where you're at? Don't even talk about how you'd lay down your life for someone until you're ready to lay down a few bucks to help that person in need. And it was really as if God was saying to him, and now he's saying to you and me, can you hear me now? Do, do you get it? Has it sunk in yet? John told us the command, love one another. He clarified that command. And then let her see, he showed us the conclusion. He showed us the part, what would result, what the conclusion would be if we started following this command, as I've already said, the conclusion will not necessarily be that other people will change. It's not some kind of guarantee that they will be so taken back by your acts of love that they will come to you and say, oh, I'm, I was so wrong. Please forgive me. I'm going to change. Sometimes that happens, and everyone will rejoice, but not always. John makes it real clear that's not what will always result. Sometimes you'll do everything right. You'll go the extra mile, you'll turn the other cheek, you'll give, you'll sacrifice, and that person will still hate you. They'll still take advantage of you. They'll continue to hurt you. They'll continue to call you names and tell others what a sucker you are. But look at what John says will result if you put this practice in your life. He says, number one, God will give you rest. If you know you've done everything God has asked of you, but that person hasn't accepted you and they still hate you and they don't want to have anything to do with you, they refuse to change, then that's their problem. And within yourself, you can experience a rest that comes from God. That, that's what verses 19 and 20 say. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. You see, sometimes we feel guilt even when we shouldn't feel guilt. And that's why John is saying, listen, God is greater than our hearts. He's greater than our consciences. And he knows our motives, and he knows our heart. And if we've done what he has asked of us, he will give us a peace, a rest within ourselves. He says, number two, he will give us a reassurance. Verse 21. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. The reassurance that we experience is that we have this new confidence in ourselves and our relationship with God. 
We are no longer living in fear. We've learned that we really can live God-confident lives because we just know God is going to work. He will give us that kind of reassurance when we really start to put this command into practice and we really start to live it out. Then number three, not only will he give us rest within ourselves and a reassurance within ourselves, but John says God will give us reward. Look at verse 22. And receive from him anything we ask because we obey his command and do what pleases him. Oh, please, please understand, I'm not some kind of prosperity preacher that says work the formula and you can ask for whatever you want. You want a new car, love somebody that, that's really hard to love and then ask God for a new car and God has to give it to you and oh, by the way, send me your money. I'm not saying that. Those are definitely not the re- kind of rewards John was talking about when he said you can receive anything you ask for. And he's not even talking about if you obey God's command and you get sick, all you have to do is ask, and God is obligated to make you better. John says this in the context of loving others that are sometimes very hard to love. And he's not talking about asking God to give us things, but working in that very area of your life, empowering you by his spirit to love in this manner. This really isn't something you can fake. Oh, oh, I'm sure you can bite your tongue and not say the wicked and the sarcastic for a while. And you can ignore or avoid the problem person and by outward appearance because you're not doing anything harmful to, to others. It might seem like you're doing the loving, but let me tell you, somewhere, sometime, you'll run into that person and they'll do something again. I promise you, they'll do it. And what you thought you had under control will all of a sudden come erupting out of you. You cannot fake this kind of love. It's born in prayer, it grows in prayer, it stays in prayer, and it comes by the Spirit of Christ who lives in you. That, that's exactly why John concluded this whole section by saying, and this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the Spirit he gave us, who is the very one that empowers us to love one another. So let me ask you again. Can you hear God now? Is he saying your name? Is there someone you need to start loving in this manner? Have you got it yet? That this really is God speaking to you, and you need to follow his command to love one another because he really knows what's best. Your father knows what's best, and he's waiting for you, waiting to give to you that rest and his peace that you desire and that reassurance and his reward. He's just waiting for you to be obedient. You remember the story of six-year-old Susie? She tells it on herself after she had become an adult. She told how her prized possession was a string of dollar store pearls. The fact that they were fake didn't bother her. She wore them everywhere, every day to school. She wore them. She wore them to church. She wore them to every store she went to. She she loved her pearls like only a six-year-old can. She also loved her daddy. His business often took him away for days at a time. The first day home would always be a time of celebration. As an adult, Susie can still remember the time he spent a week in the Far East. When he finally returned, daddy and daughter played all afternoon. And as he put her to bed that night, he asked her a question. Do you love me? Yes, daddy, I love you more than anything. More than anything? More than anything. He paused for a moment. More than your pearls? Would you give me your pearls? Oh, Daddy, I couldn't do that. I love my pearls. I understand, and he, and he kissed her goodnight. As she was falling asleep, she thought about his request. When she woke up the next morning, she thought about it again. It was on her mind that morning and later in the day. Finally, that night, she went to her dad, and, and with her dollar store pearls, she said, Daddy, I love you more than these. Here, you take them. I'm so glad to hear that. And then he stood and walked over to his briefcase and he said, I, I, I brought you a gift. She opened up the small flat box and, and, and gasped. They were genuine, real pearls, most precious. I read that story and I thought, do you suppose that your father wants to give you his precious, amazing grace, the power to love even that person? You know who I'm talking about. Do you suppose he wants to give you what you really need for that conflict you're facing? 
the peace within, his assurance, his grace, but he's just waiting for you to say, okay, I'll, I, I, I'll give you my grudge. I'll stop demanding my ways. I'll lay down my rights even though I'm right. And I will actively love that person, not because of what will result in their life, but because my father has told me, this is what's best for you. Do you hear your father calling your name? And are you ready to respond to him? Can you hear him now? Will you bring great, great joy to your father, your God, because you've decided to do what he's asked of you? Remember, Jesus is the one who said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. And what he has commanded is that we love one another. Can you hear him now? Bow your heads with me. Lord, we're pausing because we want to hear your voice. We want to hear you speak to us. Is there anyone, Lord, that we need to actively love that for whatever reason we, we haven't done it? We've been hurt or we've been betrayed or whatever. And this is so plain in your word feels like you're speaking to me you're speaking to us help us to live this out in jesus name i pray amen